Well, thank you for silencing yourselves. Uh, welcome, very welcome at this uh, first Schools Out of, uh, of the new year uh, with our speaker, Robert Bevan. Um, this is the first of a, a series that we are organizing this year, every last Friday of the month, uh, as you may know, just like the, the previous years, and this is number 30 already. Uh, the program of tonight is, um, first we'll have an introduction by uh, Wouter, and then we'll have a presentation by Robert. Uh, of course, there's an um, uh, occasion to um, ask questions afterwards, and then, uh, as usual, we end the evening with a short film selected by the curator of the Architecture Film Festival, uh, Rotterdam, Jort den Hollander. And, uh, well, the rest speaks for itself. Most of you will uh, know our organization and the place where you are, Independent School for the City, where we have a new slogan, which is, we're a playground for urban thinkers, doers, and designers, uh, in the broadest sense of the word. Um, and we organize uh, over the year courses and workshops and studios uh, based on our agenda of three main points uh, which are the Anthropocene and uh, the effects of climate change on our urban environment, uh, super diversity, the makeup of our uh, population, not only defined by uh, ethnic backgrounds but by, by a myriad of uh, factors, generations, tastes, etc., and the effects, again, that it has on the city. And uh, the third theme is uh, that of the right to the city, equality, and who can live in the city, and how can we make sure that um, uh, the city stays an, an open place for everybody to, uh, to live in. And our courses, in some way uh, or another, all have to do with one of or more of these uh, of these themes. Um, schools out, as I said, are on the last Friday of each month. Um, next month, we'll have uh, Lisa Duland, um, also very much um, uh, worth going coming to. Lisa is uh, a philosopher and um, a writer, and she was the author of a book called uh, Apocalypsophy. And if you talk about matters of the climate and the Anthropocene, then um, usually, and I guess this is a very uh, human reaction, everybody has the need to come up with an op optimistic perspective, how we can uh, get out of this mess. But she takes the opposite position. So she is actually a, a very apocalyptic doom thinker. Uh, which we thought was interesting to listen to because it's a, yeah, we think it's a very strongly needed antidote to the sort of fables and, and optimistic stories that we keep on telling each other. So it might be depressing, but I'm, I'm sure it will be interesting. <laughs> In March, we'll have Todd Rice, uh, something completely different. He is a, a researcher and a, a writer who has studied um, countries in the Middle East. And his la latest book uh, is called, uh, what is it called again? Dubai, Showpiece City, Showpiece City, the architecture uh, that made Dubai. And it deals with how the architectural image um, is used to put Dubai on the global map economically. Uh, and he's also looking into those all those new cities that you might have seen uh, come pass by on the zine, etc., in Saudi Arabia. So winter resorts and ski resorts in Saudi Arabia, uh, the linear city, etc. In April, uh, we'll have Maria Roskowska, who is originally Polish but lives in Paris with her um, uh, yeah, her office of disnovation. And they were the authors of the post-growth um, toolkit, which will be the topic of a workshop that we'll organize after her lecture, the day after, or the, or the same day. Keep an eye on our website. We haven't decided yet. And they were also uh, the publishers of uh, a book called A Bestiary of the Anthropocene, uh, looking into the hybrid 
uh, effects that the Anthropocene has uh, had on uh, biology and, and animals. Think, of, for instance, uh, the, the image on the cover of their book is that of the uh, eagle uh, catching a drone. Uh, as you know, that the eagles were trained to to catch these drones, and this is a kind of a hybridization of uh, the of the bird in um, in the Anthropocene. Uh, also, very much um, yeah, worthwhile. Then, uh, for the rest, I leave up to you. It's all on our website. May um, is to be confirmed. It's still a secret, also uh, to us, I should say. Um, and then, f finally, I want to uh, ask your attention for the two studios that we will be organizing uh, soon, first. Of all, um, this one, Living on the South Side, it is a uh, workshop which takes place on uh, two Fridays and Saturdays and one Wednesday in between, so it's very m easy to combine it with work or school or whatever. Um, it is um, connected to the theme of super diversity and looking into the uh, the atmosphere and the, um, the kind of living in Rotterdam South and projecting this in an alternative model for Feyenoord City. Uh, as you know, the, the redevelopment scheme for the area of Feyenoord uh, Stadium that we are looking to make a, you could say, a counter plan for during this workshop. And uh, the other one in April is this one, um, the plus two and a half um, degree city, uh, which is also a studio into the uh, city of Rotterdam, but then exploring what would be the effects of uh, climate change and temperature rise. So you can imagine that there will be something like uh, an extreme rise of the, of the sea level. Uh, there might also be uh, more extreme weather types, um, but there might also be effects of migration or people coming in, or maybe also people fleeing and moving to higher grounds. So uh, we will be speculating about the, the effects of this climate change, but also coming up with, um, and this is the optimistic note, with um, how would it be possible to live in a city which is so much uh, um, yeah, warmer? How do, you how do we live in a hot city? So uh, you're very welcome to uh, join either of these uh, workshops. And um, well, that's my short introduction, and I'll give the, the microphone to Wouter, who will introduce the speaker of tonight, Robert Bevan. Uh, thank you all. Um, my introduction of Robert has, uh, has two sides. One is, a, one is a, a, a bit more personal than the other. Um, the, the personal begins with, with this. Uh, as some of you know, my, my father was an Assyriologist, so he, uh, somebody who studies the cultures and languages of the ancient uh, Middle East. And uh, one of the, one of the, the things that, was, um, that nearly traumatized him, or nearly, I think traumatized him for sure, uh, was the, the knowledge that, uh, and the, the television images of the destruction being wrought on Iraq uh, uh, after the uh, Second Gulf War. Now, he himself had been to the area between, uh, between the two Gulf Wars uh, several times. He had guided people around in the, in the ruins, but then ruins of uh, 5,000 years old, of Nineveh and Babylon and cities of Ur, etc. And so he, he, had, uh, he had grown to, to love this area, but most of all, his only material with, with which he worked were the clay tablets that came from this uh, region and that he pieced together from fragments l all over the world. So when he saw how the American army more or less uh, passively, actively uh, condoned the destruction of entire archaeological sites of, of uh, the, the museum, the uh, archaeological museum of Iraq was more or less demolished and, and plundered. Um, 
sandbags were being filled with archaeological uh, remains and then uh, used to, to stop tanks uh, in, in the war. So the, the, this, this was something extremely personal uh, for him. And I, I had also uh, read this book that I found uh, online, uh, The Destruction of Memory, Architecture at War. So this, this held a, a specific uh, meaning uh, for me and my family. And um, then uh, at a certain point we were with Crimson, we were, go we were in, uh, in, in, uh, in Venice and we were invited to, to, a, to a take out pizza a dinner at a friend and who suddenly out of the dark depths of this uh, palazzo came walking towards the pizza table was a man and, I, 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 and then he said your name is Robert. And uh, it's turned out to be Robert Bevan, the writer of this book. So I'm extremely uh, happy that, that Robert is here to, uh, uh, to, to share with us the stories about not just this book, but his other, is, because in the meantime, he wrote yet another book called Monumental Lies. And I think Monumental Lies is a book that, that uh, will, uh, I don't want to give away the plot, but um, I, I think this will hold a very strong meaning for all of you, and maybe for some of you even on, a, on an emotional level, because it is a book about the, the idea, what do, we do, what do we do with the statues and the monuments and the heritage and the, uh, that, that comes from times before uh, when we, uh, that, that, were, that, that are absolute scandalous and absolutely embarrassing and absolutely hor horrifying right now. Uh, in, in, in Rotterdam, we have had a similar discussion in the Witte de Witstraat, the Witte de Wit, called after a, 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 a seafaring plunderer called Witte de Wit, and uh, the, the art center there that went to, through a whole painful process of renaming itself and not to, to be away, come away from this Witte de Wit uh, association. But on the other hand, we are here in Rotterdam. And Rotterdam is a city that has done away, more or less, and also, um, um, how do you say, out of conviction, has done away with its entire, um, entire pre-war heritage. Because after Rotterdam was bombed, it was the choice of Rotterdam not to restore anything, but to wipe all the rests and the, away, even if it could have been restored like in, a sit, like, like in other cities. So I think we here in Rotterdam sit in, in, exp, in, in a kind of a tense expectation of what Robert uh, uh, has to say, because this city has such a, you could say, a fraught and such a, uh, maybe a traumatic uh, uh, relationship to heritage and the history. So on that note, I'd like to introduce you to Robert Bevan. Thank you. I'm juggling my notes and the microphone and my specs. So if I wave my arms around and you can't hear, let me know. Um, Thank you, Peter. Yeah, the last book was specifically about uh, monuments and the fate of monuments and the targeting of monuments in uh, hot conflicts. Um, this uh, new book, um, Monumental Lies, is essentially a sort of, it does co cover some aspects uh, of wars, but it's also more about peacetime culture wars and the conflicts around that. And uh, what I'm always interested in um, as a journalist, and I'm also a heritage consultant who does similar work to some of um, Crimson's work, um, is how you intervene in the city and the politics of heritage and the lies that the built environment can tell us. Um, so, because I start from the presumption that we, if we read, if we, we can read a city and that um, it will tell us about our past, um, like a book on a library shelf or a, a document in an archive box, monuments and architecture are the evidence of history. Um, what's more, uh, the city's constitu constituent elements, um, from the palace to the slum, are the material um, evidence, actual physical traces of past events 
as well as witnesses to previous ways of thinking. Um, embedded within them, uh, these containers of our daily lives are politics and economics and values that may be very different from our own, but which are still having their effect today. Um, as Hannah Arendt observed, the reality and real reliability of the human world rests primarily on the fact that we are surrounded by things more permanent than the activity by which they are produced. So when our cities are reshaped as fantasies about the past, when monuments and statues tell lies about who or what events deserve immortalization, the historical record is being manipulated. When we are told falsely that certain architectural styles are alien to our culture or that people naturally prefer to live among their own kind, the re reliability of the world is being called into question. Our streets and squares are not the morally neutral, um, iner inert assemblages of brick and stone that they pretend to be. And even absences can be telling. I mean, we need only look around us, and I'm talking about the UK context here, and I don't expect it's that different here. We, if we, we need only look around and see or not see the memorials to female achievement or the black experience or queer lives. Uh, they're just not there. Uh, for those with the power or money to place a likeness on a pedestal, monuments are more often a tool to obscure the real facts of history, to shape a chosen narrative, to invent nationalist and civic traditions, and to enforce imagined communities that extend only to those deemed to belong. Um, statues of genocide heirs and colonial mass murders, murderers are put up in squares and on street corners for edification. So monuments tell deliberate, calculated lies, and they're lies that are being marshaled in the culture wars. Um, the term culture war has often been ascribed to Pat Buchanan, speaking at the 1992 Republican Convention in the aftermath of the LA uprising, which happened after the acquittal of the LAPD officers who brutally beat Rodney King. Um, Buchanan called for a war for the soul of America. He said it's a cultural war, as critical to the kind of nation we one day want to be as, as was the Cold War itself. He, call, he called for US cities to be taken back street by street, presumably from people of color. Um, the 90s, 1980s and 1990s version of the culture wars often took the form of accusations of political correctness in UK parlance. These aimed, as the anti-woke campaign does today, to stymie progress on social justice and reverse its gains. So we're not so much in the middle of, um, um, of a brand new culture war as deep amidst the latest campaign. And with capitalism and the planet in crisis and neither the parliamentary right or left able to effectively solve this permanent crisis, culture wars are a useful distraction from demands for economic changes and material gains. On the one hand, there's a kind of 9-11 fearfulness of the other, post 9-11. On the other, neoliberal land grab of the public realm and the rise in nationalism and nativism. And on the other, the black feminist, decolonial and queer critiques of the monumental canon that are having some success in changing the conversation. Activists are demanding not just more and better statues, but the toppling of stone and bronze street corner killers that have been used to whitewash reputations and justify the stolen fortunes of entire continents. Historic places and commemorative landscapes have been both contested over and over again down centuries, but this time around, architecture and heritage on the culture war's front line. And often a telltale sign that a monument to an individual or an event um, isn't what it seems, it's telling lies, that it was erected is that it was erected decades or even centuries after the fact. Um, and the Confederate monuments in the US are uh, the perfect example of this. Um, it was only after the American Civil War that the 
formerly enslaved in the reconstruction area began to make uh, social, economic, and political gains, um, that white supremacists shifted the focus of their Civil War memorialization from the graveyard, from grave markers to and battlefield markers to, to sit town and city centers, um, often in the courthouse square, often Confederate figures of generals related to where laws were made and given um, by organizations such as the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, and these obelisks and generals and metal foot soldiers, uh, they weren't acts of mourning. They were instead aiming to assert control over Jim Crow era segregated space. They were territorial markers. They were racist markers trying patrolling the city. Uh, they had a very particular purpose. And a hell of a lot of them were erected not straight after the Civil War, but in the 1920s when um, there was agitation from returning black soldiers. Um, and then again, as right into the post-war period as well. So well, you know, the, the decades after the Civil War had ended. They were not, they were not memorials to death and mourning. They were, they were narratives and, and racial markers. Um, Stone Mountain, it's hard to get the scale of that here. Stone Mountain in Georgia, the biggest bas relief in the world. You could fit a, a person in, that, in the horse's mouth. That's the scale of it. Um, it was kind of begun in the 1920s as a, co as a Confederate memorial. The Ku Klux Klan in their second incarnation, incarnation were, was founded on the top of Stone Mountain. Um, uh, yes, work began in 1914 and then there was di various disputes and it stopped. Um, and, but in 1954, following the landmark case of Brown versus the Board of Education, which was a blow to segregation and the birth of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the state of Georgia actually bought the site in, uh, in 1958 under a segregationist governor and work recommenced in 1964. This was completed in 1972, this massive white supremacist statue. 1972, it had a theme park at its foot. There was a plantation theme park uh, where the workers were, 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 weren't, call, weren't the enslaved, but they were called hands or workers. Sort of the, 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 the whole narrative that being created was, was that recent. Um, the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis in 2019 has accelerated a pre-existing revisionist trend that's seen the toppling of these statues and others across the world, especially those honoring figures associated with slavery or colonialism. Viewed through the lens of social justice, this is a timely response to the partial and prejudicial history these commemorative monuments symbolize. From the perspective of the conservative right, however, removal can amount to a form of woke grievance archaeology or cancel culture. This is, it is not. This is simply the consequences of lies about the past finally being called to account and a demand that the commemorative landscape of the present reflect larger truths and a more accurate history. Um, this is um, from the city of Bristol in the west of England, which was one of the chief uh, slaving ports um, of the trans transatlantic um, um, slave in uh, uh, trade in, uh, in slaves, um, the triangle trade. Um, and in the UK, there's a very different dynamic, but in some ways very similar. Um, you, know, you didn't get uh, many enslaved people living in the UK. Um, it was like they offshored their issues. Um, and here, Edward Colston, who's that statue there um, in the middle, um, was the city's most honored son. And this uh, garden was created around him. It's now a traffic island. It looks very different. Um, and he was at the center of Bristol's self-identity as a city made admirable by a legacy of philanthropy, of charitable giving, and Colston commemorations 
included not just the city centre bronze of Colston we see here that was toppled by Black Lives Matter activists in the summer of 2020, or the name of nearby Colston Hall, a concert hall built on a sugar mill site, but in the stained glass windows of the cathedral, the names of streets, schools, hospitals, and armhouses were all named in, in his honour. Um, he gave the money to lots of these organisations. But when Colston had died in 1721, it was after a lifetime leading the Atlantic slave trade, where he was complicit in the deaths of many tens of thousands of Africans, branded and shipped in the sickening conditions of the Middle Passage. So like with the Confederate statues, appearances are deceptive too. This, this statue was not put up by a grieving citizenry immediately after his death in 1721. It was erected in 1895. That's more than 170 years later and half a century after the slave trade ended in most of the British Empire. Why? This, this and other statues were raised as part of a consciously shaped cult of Colston, promoted by Bristol's merchant elite. Uh, while defending the mercantile narrative of the city's imperial history, the cults at the time was not so much about enforcing racial oppression locally, like the Jim Crow Confederate statues, because there weren't that many black Brist Bristolians at that time. It was more about patrolling class. Colston was a historical figurehead, useful in creating a paternalist and cross-class civic narrative in the face of rising industrial unrest and labour organisation amongst the city's workers. That merchant elite that put up all these memorials to Colston is still operating in Bristol. In recent years, it lobbied against changes to the statue's plaque that would have told the, more of the truth about Colston's bloody history. Um, this is something local campaigners have been pushing for for decades to get some changes made to the wording of the plaque, not even to get the statue pulled down, just changes to the wording of the plaque. So when those uh, 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 efforts were blocked again, activists took matters into their own hands. Um, they uh, rolled Colston into the same harbour from which his slave ships had departed. And this was poetic justice, and we should support the protesters. But in my uh, book, I argue for a different perspective. Uh, a layered interpretation at scale um, does not allow this, that doesn't allow the monuments to remain standing unchanged or, and the honour given to people at Colston left in place, but or which also sees them as important for the historical record. Firstly, though, if we accept that buildings and monuments can be artefacts that are the evidence of history, then problems arise if this evidence, if this material is not authentic. Um, this is the crematorio one at Auschwitz. Um, it operated from August 1940. Um, and when the ca Auschwitz expanded to Birkenau and four purpose-built gas chambers went into operation, um, killings at this crematoria were phased out, gas chamber were phased out, its furnaces and chimneys were dismantled, um, and the holes in the roof used for introducing Cyclone B pellets were closed. Um, the, the, the gas chambers and crematoria at Birkenau were blown up towards the end of the war by the retreating Nazis trying to cover their tracks as the Red Army approached. So. What this, uh, what this has led to is that because the, those uh, uh, ruins at Birkenau uh, uh, were in such a poor state, um, Holocaust deniers started to claim that uh, without, hole, without holes, there was no Holocaust. Um, if, you if there were no holes in the collapsed concrete roof slabs to deliver the poison, then, the then, then these buildings weren't gas chambers, then the Holocaust didn't happen. So this is the use of the architectural in very dark ways. Um, but unfortunately, 
these Holocaust deniers were given something of unwitting material to argue their case because Crematoria 1 was reconstructed after the war. This is the, re this is the reconstructed version. It's not, uh, it's not authentic. It's a museum copy. And why it happened is partly because of a political, Polish political narrative to do with who were the victims, uh, and, uh, um, and partly simply because the Birkenau ruins were a long way away, and most tourists couldn't be bothered going there. Um, so, th so the chimney was reconstructed, the holes in the roof were reconstructed, uh, which uh, which gave Holocaust deniers the uh, an in for their for their arguments. Even today, the Auschwitz website says this object is preserved in an original state to a large degree. That's it's just not true. Um, and there are grave dangers in that. And the no holes, no Holocaust argument was at the heart of a famous libel trial in which the disgraced historian David Irving sued Deborah Lipstadt and Penguin Books over um, Lipstadt's claim that Irving was a Holocaust denier. And it was a Dutch architectural historian, uh, I'm gonna, I can't say, and believe, say this before a Dutch audience, m and ruin my ruin the pronunciation, Robert, van, Robert Jan van Pelt, who you probably all know, uh, he is now based in Canada. Um, he testified at this trial, um, amassing hundreds of pages of evidence from the ruins themselves, construction drawings, invoices for building materials, and other architectural documentation to prove the presence of the holes and the gas chambers. Unfortunately, Irving lost his case in the face of the old overwhelming evidence that um, Jan van Pelt helped provide. Um, and it's, th th it's this uh, uh, scholarship that informed that I f have found really important and also has informed the work of people like Forensic Architecture um, and looking at the value of the architectural in improving crimes. But it also shows that the devil really can be in the detail and the details have to be authentic. Um, moving on to, this is Dresden um, a couple of years ago. Everything you see there, from the cobbles to the cupola on the top of the Frauenkirche, is a fake. All reconstructed in the last couple of decades. Um, many worry that we are in a post-truth age where emotion and beliefs have achieved primary primacy over reality. On the face of it, architecture should be immune from such post-truth forces because there will be appear to be no more indisputable evidence of the form of the present and shape of the past than a weighty and long-standing building. The very physicality of architecture, its relative longevity, gives the impression of certainty, and what you see is what you get, lack of complication. Reality, Philip K. Dick reminds us, is what that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. As we saw from Crematoria 1, we cannot always take buildings at face value. But nonetheless, the architectural is a useful dupe for those wishing to manipulate the present by misusing the past. Because the apparent outward pass impassivity of non-figurative structures is particularly effective in disguising its ideological content. So in a context where anti-cosmopolitans um, and racists are on the offensive, the foolish belief that this townscape is disinterested makes its manipulation an effective weapon against the truth. The architectural and commemorative environment thus has a much underestimated role in fostering and cementing falsehoods about history. It's a tool that, remind, that renders these falsehoods physical and makes them harder to refute. So when buildings and monuments are inauthentic, Hannah Arendt's test of reliability becomes undermined. So we think that demands for authenticity would be being heightened, but instead we're moving away from the concept and organizations such as UNESCO um, are part of the problem. So, uh, and 
uh, the, the Dresden used to be called the Florence on the Elbe before it was bombed in the uh, Second World War. It's often criticized as uh, Las Vegas on the Elbe these days for its kind of, uh, uh, its disnification. And it's not politically neutral. This, the, the, the rebuildings of the church and this site, the Neumarkt, was a, a site of pilgrimage by Pegida, the anti-Islam um, uh, uh, organization that grew out of Dresden, and also the Alternative for Deutschland and neo-Nazis have all come here to sort of, it's become a totem for the far right. Um, and there are similar projects across Germany as well that are kind of, because in Germany it's kind of the, the culture wars have taken on perhaps their most ar architectonic character. Um, here as part of a concerted attempt to rebuild blitz city centers as historical pastiches, we are seeing not just the rehabilitation of classical architecture, which was for a while entirely tainted by the Third Reich associations, but also the rebuilding of long valley palaces, churches, and whole quarters of city centers, as if Hitler had never happened. Um, in 2009, UNESCO struck off Dresden as a World Heritage Site. Not for all this fakery in the city center, in the historic center, but because of the construction of a bridge further down the Elbe River. Um, and there are similar projects happening elsewhere, as, as I said, in, in Germany, such as the uh, Humboldt Forum in Berlin, all over Berlin, in fact. And this is Frankfurt, this is the old technical town hall, a post-war rebuild, not a great building, obviously, but, um, uh, but this is what replaces it. Um, this is Frankfurt Old Town today. Um, some buildings are contemporary buildings with historical idioms, and they're quite interesting. Others are fakery with genuine bits of salvage, architectural salvage, attached to them. And they are not ideologically neutral. Often the figures involved in making this happen are li linked to Germany's right and far right, um, and to politicians and uh, really shady characters. Um, and so there's an ideological war underway masquerading as a style war. Modernism, whose record at its utopian best was about building for a more egalitarian post-war world, is today under attack by resurgent and reactionary architectural traditionalism. Arguments about beauty, in particular a Trojan horse, concealing a desire to impose conservative historicism. Now, not just architecturally, but across society. Um, of course, no particular architectural style has an intrinsic political value. Instead, architecture and style are put to political uses. It's, it's about the intent. Um, it's useful, for example, for the right to demonize modernism as a style promoted by cosmopolitan elites, when they don't want to fund architectural infrastructure or welfare state or build social housing. Um, in that case, horizontal windows ho rather than austerity become the problem. Unfortunately, under the influence of political expediency and in the wake of a postmodern theory hostile to historical, material historical materialism and what it sees as a totalizing theories essential concepts that have been valued for more than a century and promoted by the likes of socialist William Morris are being abandoned. And I'm aware that, you know, postmodern is past its peak, but I think its influence is still pervasive without us it being named as such. Um, Morris's ideas were set out in 1877 um, Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings Manifesto, which was trying to protect the authenticity of English cathedrals in particular from Victorian restorers who are trying to turn back the clock. Um, and Morris's ideas later found their way into key international conservation documents. The 1931 Charter of Athens, for instance, that Le Corbusier really had a big hand in. 
and the 1964 Charter of Venice, which from then on was the main international charter on how you address an historic site. They demanded authenticity in preservation and reconstruction. For example, intellectual honesty in being able to visually and visibly separate new work from old. However, previously precise terms such as reconstruction or restoration are now being used without that old precision and are being undermined by potentially useful but ethically fraught and unregulated technologies such as digital copy, copies, 3D printing, etc., that offer a superficial faux authenticity alongside uh, these kind of exercises at a large scale. Uh, this is Moss Star Bridge, um, the reconstructed Moss Star Bridge. Um, and the rot in this kind of conceptual shift starts at the top. Within, in, in UNESCO's case, it's about political convenience, misjudged, misjudged attempts at post-conflict reconciliation, and a desire to resist iconoclasts such as Daesh, ISIS. So, um, in 2001, when uh, the notion of rebuilding the Bamiyan Buddhas after the Taliban destroyed them was deemed unacceptable fakery by UNESCO. But only a few years later, the organization embraced rebuilding copies in, th in the name of reconciliation, the myth of reconciliation. And Mostar Bridge is a prime example. Um, it was, uh, it's in Bosnia, there was a very complex shifting of territories in the war, but essentially the, the East Bank became Muslim and the West Bank Croat, and that is still true today. Um, you know, the, the, the bridge was targeted and destroyed um, and then rebuilt with the help of the World, World Bank and UNESCO, and it reopened in July 2004. Um, largely a brand new material because the old stones were too, too, too ruined to be reincorporated. But despite appearances and the symbolism of bridging communities on both sides of the river, the city remains as divided as ever. Reconstruction as reconciliation can be an illusion. There's a, there's a school just near the bridge, one building, Muslim and Croat schools operate within it separately. They have separate classrooms, separate playtimes, separate bells, separate curricula, separate teachers. Only the toilets are shared. Uh, lots of young uh, Mostarians are still leaving Mostar because the city is divided. It's hard to live a normal life there. The, the reconstructed, reconstructed bridge sows an illusion of reconciliation. But that, even that wasn't enough for UNESCO. In 2005, the, the bridge and the area around it was declared a World Heritage Site. It's barely a year old. Um, and it's the, it was a designation that was only possible by jumping through linguistic and conceptual hoops to ensure that the facsimile bridge made it past UNESCO's own strict criteria about authenticity that derived from the Charter of Venice, etc., etc. So that's a criterion that actually requires that historic fabric actually be historic. So, I mean, there are, there, there are good reasons to resist cultural genocide airs by, by reconstructing symbolic communal structures in the face of attempts at cultural genocide. There are good reasons to reconstruct but that doesn't mean reconciliation. But declaring a 21st century structure as a World Heritage Site a year after it was completed is making a nonsense of heritage and the authentic. Similarly, in 2015, UNESCO declared that war-ravaged Palmyra in Syria, another World Heritage Site, would be rebuilt without even exa having examined the damage. At the same time, the emphasis was put on the damage to Palmyra caused by ISIS and not that caused by Assad's forces and the Russians. Indeed, Putin's army was praised by UNESCO for recapturing Palmyra. 
ignoring his bombing of hospitals and civilian centers. This can only have encouraged him, emboldened him. So in its eagerness to frustrate iconoclasts, UNESCO has set aside fundamental principles, and this is having consequences today, I would argue, in places like the Ukraine. So we have more data about the world, more measurements, more images of it than ever before in history. But we live in a time when verifiable facts are trashed as fake, as unreliable, along with the expertise that identifies them. And where even the heritage organizations are facilitating the confusion. Authenticity is a word in danger of being rendered meaningless by brand marketeers and pop psychologists, but which, which is too important to lose to such slipperiness. All manner of evidence is required if we are to successfully smash the mythology of colonialism and empire and have an honest reckoning with the past. We need to place historical materialism and material evidence alongside witness testimony at the core of this process, rather than the more unreliable and problematic ideas of memory. And in this, I'm kind of revising some of the ideas I talked about in the, uh, the destruction of memory that Fauta talked about just then. I think memory is given far, and collective memory is being given far too much prominence these days, as opposed to fact and objectivity. Um, in the UK, in the post-George Floyd phase of statue toppling, various commentators have claimed that statues and monuments aren't even history. Um, this won't do. Yes, they can be bad history, but their very evasions are, can reveal deeper historical truths. The evidence supporting the historical record is not only words on a page, but also material artifacts. Leon Trotsky might seem an unlikely source of design wisdom, but he was an astute cultural observer and understood the role of architecture as a record of history. He wrote that the, of the Renaissance, that it, the Renaissance only begins when the new social class, already culturally satiated, feels itself strong enough to come out from under the yoke of the Gothic art, and to look at Gothic art and all that preceded it as material for its own disposal. This is more than just an elegant metaphor. He believed that architecture, above all the arts, revealed the dialect dialectical processes of the arc of history. Now, if we accept that the architectural and the monumental can be evidence, what do we do about them? So, I, I believe that despite all the lies and distortions, monuments can have a good faith purpose. If suitably transformed from sites of honor into sites of shame or conscience or reactivated as thinking sites. Architecture more generally can help prove criminal responsibility for misdeeds such as ethnic cleansing and genocide. Who dropped the barrel bomb? Who shelled the bridge? Who looted the museum and smashed its artifacts? Who, at the Grenfell Tower in London, allowed the wrapping of a high-rise public housing tower with deadly inflammable cladding and uh, social murder? Where monuments were erected to the perpetrators of terrible deeds, they can tell us about the cynicism of the monument's backers. When erected to foster lies, they tell us that those lies were thought necessary. Certainly, though, this objectionable landscape can't be left untouched. However, at the same time as needing to create a more equitable physical environment, we have a duty to ensure that we don't forget the ruling class has been perfectly willing to honor genocide heirs such as Cecil Rhodes or Christopher Columbus in our public spaces. The answers aren't as simple as they might first seem though. Uh, so before we embark on a new iconoclastic wave, we need to acknowledge the many myths and misunderstandings about why our commemorative landscape is the way it is and about great e iconic episodes of the past, especially that those that came at the end of totalitarianism. What we think we know about um, the end of monuments at the end of the Second World War in Germany 
or after Saddam Hussein is often wrong, or in um, the uh, former Soviet bloc. The popular understanding of uh, often overlooks very grey areas. There's a, l a lot of complexities to iconoclasm that we need to be aware of before we embark on a, on a new iconoclastic wave. And this is just one example. Um, this is a, uh, a Soviet Army War Memorial in Sofia, Bulgaria. Um, and in 2011, the monument was painted overnight by a group of anonymous artists who call themselves Destructive Creation, who dressed the Soviet soldiers as American pop culture characters like Superman and Captain America and Santa Claus in his Coca-Cola um, incarnation. Um, Ronald McDonald, I think, is in there somewhere as well. Anyway, um, the caption below roughly means in keeping with the times. And the intervention could be seen as a, a critique or a celebration of capitalist consumerism or a calculated insult to Soviet militarism, or both. Um, and Putin was furious at the injury to the memorial, and the paint job was removed in a few days. Given his bloody military campaigns to impose authoritarian rule in places such as Chechnya, Syria, and now Ukraine, it might seem a bit rich that Putin demanded that the Soviet war memorial be respected. But, but can we dismiss the Soviet historical losses? Millions of Russians did die in the fight against fascism, uh, liberating Europe from fascism. Bulgaria was liberated, but then occupied by the Soviets. Both things are true. And there are similar complexities around Columbus in the States, um, where f Italian immigrants, for instance, were racialized as white, partly by using the Columbus history as the, a sort of a narrative justification um, for uh, Native Americans, of, obviously. Uh, Columbus was a genocidal catastrophe. Um, and Trump was willing to send the National Guard in to protect the Columbus uh, monuments in Chicago. Um, so how best then can we use, to use German terminology, uh, turn an Ehrenmal a monument that honours into a manmal, one that symbolises shame or regret. A po I'd suggest a policy of subversive transformation demands a comprehensive recontextualization at scale that changes meanings, ideally in an additive layered way. And these new layers should challenge but not entirely obliterate the monument so that its original meaning can be still understood, even if the honor is undercut. A small plaque may offer some explanation, but will not alone change the monument's public role or the context in which it operates. So there's a, just a couple of examples here. This is Cecil Rhodes, don't know if you know much about him. He was a big colonial figure, very violent, uh, founded the De Beers, uh, Diamond Company in South Africa, uh, ruthless, murderous campaigns across Southern Africa, uh, helped lay the foundations for par apartheid. Even in his day, he was seen as an extremist. Um, yet, when he died, he left money for this college to be built in Oxford. Um, this is the uh, Oriel College, and um, this is the Rhodes Wing with his thick statue at the top of it. Uh, the campaign against Rhodes and Rhodes statues actually started in Cape Town in South Africa, because uh, obviously Rhodes has a significant legacy there, and then moved as part of the decolonialization movement amongst Oxford students. Um, long, long battles about this statue. Um, this eventually was the college's solution, this little plaque at the foot with its kind of a mealy mouth explanation about what it was all about. So he stays unchanged amongst the city centre. That's the solution. It's not good enough. Um, and the British government have, have introduced in the planning system something called a, a, a retain and explain 
policy, which is just bad faith. Um, essentially, it means retain everything, explain nothing or little. Um, and uh, this is a prime example of that. So what are the alternatives? Um, this is Gladstone, former UK Prime Minister. Um, I'm going to have to hurry up. So he, he was... Um, uh, his family was associated with plantation slavery, but this statue was erected um, out in the east end of London outside a, uh, a match factory, which was later the site of a massive uh, struggle by women for better conditions and was in very important to the women's labour movement in the UK. And a few decades ago, 100 years after the match girl strike, um, his hands started to be painted blood red overnight. Nobody knows who's do it, and every so often it'll be cleaned off, but then the red blood will come back. Um, and these days, it's kind of seen in sort of Black Lives Matter era as a comment on the um, family's uh, slavery connections, but actually it's to do with class relations. And um, these guerrilla uh, interventions are, are, are really useful. Um, but they are, um, and so if you if you removed the statue altogether, as some people want to do, that the opportunity to comment, to have dialogue with the past, with these with these artifacts, uh, is vanishes, and you 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 lose a richness within the um, the uh, the built environment. Um, this was Banksy's suggestion for what should happen to the Colson statue. He thought put the cult battered statue back on the pedestal and add some bronze figures of protesters eternally pulling it down to commemorate the day in 2020. Uh, I, I think it was a little glib, but um, it's also interesting. Um, and I'm just going to have to whiz through the next one because I'm running out of time. This is, um, so how, how, how do we permanently change those? Often these are temporary temporary changes, how do you permanently change a, turn a site of honour into a site of shame? There's, there's very few examples, actually, of this being done around the world. Um, it's a sort of, it's an issue in its infancy. This is um, Carlos Colombino's um, uh, reworking of a statue of the Paraguayan dictator Alfredo Stroessner. He basically took it apart and put it between two concrete blocks and, and the, the sense of oppression is, is really strong again might be seen as this kind of liberal a bit literal but really interesting but there, there are so few of these but my favorite is this my favorite example of transformation this is uh, Bolzano in Alpine northern Italy um, it was a town which was very complicated linguistically and culturally. It had a German element, speaking element, an Italian speaking element. Um, it was occupied by Mussolini's fascists and then by the Nazis, and et cetera, et cetera. Really complicated. But uh, it had a huge fascist new town, lots of fascist monuments, including this, which is probably the biggest, biggest surviving fascist artwork in Europe. It's 198 square meters um, on the front of what was the former fascist headquarters in the town. Um, tells the story of fascism from Mussolini's march on Rome in 1922 through the war against Ethiopia, Spanish Civil War, etc., etc. It was only completed in 1957, well after the war. Astonishing. Um, so finally. In 2010, there was this, like some local historians that had enough um, and created a debate in the town. So we need to, this can't continue. We need to address these monuments. Because unlike other countries, Italy had basically done nothing about its fascist architecture and memorials. They had taken away images of Mussolini and changed some street names. But the, the, the big bulk of, 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 of the fascist iconography and fascist monumentality remains uncommentative on in place. There's not even a m proper museum to fascism so far, apart from one created in Bolzano. Um, so this was the winning solution about what to do uh, with this fascist freeze. Some people had wanted to remove it altogether. 
some people to curtain it, cover it in uh, a solid screen so you can't see it anymore, etc., etc. But the winning scheme um, was again a um, um, so just go back a bit uh, the, at the centre of the um, that is under this is Muss Mussolini on his horse, the new Augustus Caesar, and below it is the fascist slogan "Believe, Obey, Combat," and the winning scheme is a direct commentary on that. Again, it draws on Hannah Arendt, and it says, no one has the right to obey in the three local languages. And the, the wording is from a radio interview where Hannah Arendt paraphrased Kant while discussing her book about Eichmann and totalitarianism. And the choice of words is a clever layered commentary on the fascist slogan. The monument is preserved, but its meaning has been changed by the addition of the condemnatory phrase. Aaron reminds us that we have an ethical duty to resist, that there is always a choice, including whether we properly act to address contested heritage in ways that serve both justice and history. The minimalism of the intervention is, say the artists, a pointed contrast to the grandiloquence of fascist aesthetics. Truths have been told, and an Ehrenmal has become a manmal. Only a few years ago, Bolzano, this town, had neo-fascist city councillors. They've lost their seats since, and in the last national uh, elections, the Brothers of Italy did really poorly in this region. I don't think one can put it down to the monuments, but maybe one, maybe the conversation about the monuments was, was, was part of making that difference. Um, or, or did the monument and the changes to it have no impact at all? Because at the end of the day, aren't we giving these objects too much power? Figurative statues are simply the most attention-seeking, the most visible aspects of heritage manipulation, and most visible only after their true meaning has been brought to our attention by diligent activists. There's a danger of a culture war collusion in focusing attention on symbols whose removal creates an illusion of change while systemic injustice continues unaltered. Isn't it mass incarceration rather than a problematic, problematic commemorative landscape that's the chief motor of contemporary Jim Crow in the United States? We need to question the degree to which changing the built environment genuinely alters our lives and values. There are many determinist delusions, cause and effect expectations about the impact of monuments and of iconoclasm, or indeed architecture and architectural style, more generally on us and on our politics and societies. Winston Churchill's often repeated remark that we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us is in truth a problematic oversimplification. There is an underlying thread of determinism here that architecture and design have heavily invested in and promoted the belief that design may not simply build more equitable places that positively shape lives, which it can, but will actually cause social change rather than simply reflect it. It's a view that not only marginalizes the agency of people in deriving, driving societal change, but peddles myths about our behavioural responses to the physical environment that persist to this day. Arguably, these myths continue when we believe that a more progressive and inclusive monumental landscape will itself produce social change. Yes, we need to be able to separate out truths and lies, not just online or in the news, but in the built environment. Yes, we need to look at ways that we can layer our monuments and our cities that turn sites of honour into sites of shame, that change the meaning of the past without losing altogether the evidence of that past. But we must also distinguish between irrelevant symbolism and genuinely damaging ideology, between positive, real-world, political and socio-economic changes and misguided architectural determinism. It, it's possible, too, that tolerating com uncomfortable evidence might be easier within the context of real-world gains. And the real change comes through the agency of people, not through changes to symbols or material objects. Without such an approach, there's the real concern that we, in the name of progress, 
are paving the way for dangerous Humpty Dumpty populism where truth, including truth in architecture, is whatever you say it is. If we fake or destroy the evidence, including that of the architectural record, how can we ever learn from it or guard it against those who would use an absence of facts against us? Fundamentally, if we can no longer trust that tangible world around us to tell the truth, we're in real trouble. We need to be able to trust the veracity of our built environment. Hannah Arendt can guard it, guide us here too. She warned that the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between true and false no longer exists. Evidence, including the material evidence of architecture, matters. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> What do you think about uh, redevelopment, adaptive reuse, call it whatever, as a concept? Because, um, I mean, in reality, historic buildings are often um, changed, you know, like, and they don't become museums, because how many museums do you need in a city? They become offices, they become hotels, whatever. So do you think there is a way to preserve the historic heritage and uh, do you have any good examples of that? Yes, I mean, that's my, that's my bread and butter, how I work, do, do, do it, work in that world. Um, it, it's, and I talked about the William Morris principles, scientific protection of ancient buildings. They would, for instance, purists would, uh, for instance, put tile creasing instead of replacing a lost brick. I think that's going a, a bit too far, but adaptive reuse can show those, show those layers between old and new, and they can be wonderfully rich and collaged, and I think a brilliant example is David Chipperfield's Noyce Museum in Berlin, uh, which does that layering of history and evidence really well. I, d I, I, I don't think it's necessary in every circumstance or that you can make a blanket hard and fast rule for every site. Every building is different, every case is different and you have to respond to that. But as a general approach, I think additive layers, uh, visible differences create really rich, uh, rich additions to the accumulation of history. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Robert, for a wonderful book. I'm reading it now and enjoying it. Um, um, uh, I d because I obviously didn't read it. Um, and you mentioned Mostar yeah. as an example of fake authenticity. Um, so I, I have a question about this. Have you, been consi have you considered um, mourning and reconstruction, um, or let's say, fake authenticity as a way of mourning. Because why I ask this, I was in Mostar raising the same point, and then I was introduced to a whole scholarship and field work where um, architects you know, worked yeah. with people and people wanted the bridge to be reconstructed exactly as it was, yeah. even though traditional methods were not possible yeah. to apply. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of solutions that were proposed, quite a similar debate yeah. to Notre Dame that we have today, yeah. for instance. Um, so I was just wondering, how did you tackle this or, or not? What do you think about yeah. authenticity as a way of mourning, yeah. let's say? I, 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 I think Mostar Bridge is a case where reconstruction is an act of resistance to, to acts of cultural genocide. I don't have a problem with reconstructing it. What I do have a problem with is the belief that it, it, that act of reconstruction leads to reconciliation, necessarily. 
There's a lot of myths promoted within the heritage community internationally that it does. It's taken as a, a given by UNESCO in document after or an ICOMOS in document after document. There's no evidence for it. Sometimes it's the opposite. Reconstruction can create new problems uh, as it has elsewhere in Bosnia. Um, it's not created solu societal solutions or, or united communities in Mostar. My problem isn't, isn't resisting isn't like isn't resisting genocide as like the Poles rebuilding Warsaw um, after the Second World War. It, it's the intent to which these the intent behind the the uh, the reconstruction, why it's happening, and the myths that of often revolve around the episodes as well, which I think are often really unhelpful. Uh, thank you very much for a, a wonderful uh, discourse on what could be called kind of um, rhetorical culture in, in architecture. Uh, an architecture that, that is reduced almost to rhetoric, um, which is not just bad, but maybe also uh, very uh, contradictory to uh, a claim of architecture over decades to be the, um, let's say, the... Uh, torchbearer of honesty and yeah. truth, right? Um, uh, so wonderful. But, but I, w I wonder how you compare your discourse with um, something that, um, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, quite similar to what happened 120 years ago or so, um, when there was the Battle of Styles. Um, and uh, a few architects also were completely fed up with, uh, with this culture where um, architects were actually more like uh, graphic designers of facades and, and, and uh, you, you, you probably know uh, the examples. And uh, I wonder, uh, rather than what you are um, maybe promoting, uh, um, let's say a, a stronger respect for the veracity of, 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 the, of uh, urban design and architecture, uh, suppose that you would have to stand there as a contemporary Karl Kraus. Contemporary? Karl Kraus. Okay. Or yeah, Adolf yeah. Loos. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> so if you, could you imagine yeah. um, uh, to take up a role um, becoming protagonist like them at this moment in time? Well Is there a chance for such a role? <laughs> I think the rhetoric point is very well made. Um, I like historic architecture, I'm a heritage consultant. Um, I, I don't even have a massive objection to neo-vernacular architecture particularly. Um, big fan of classical architecture. I d as I said there briefly, and I say it more than once in the book, and people still don't see it, um, there is no ideological content in bricks and mortar. They're, they're, they're it's not there. It's it's brought the con the ideolo ideology is brought to it and imposed upon it, or is in the intent behind it, and it's the and that's what I'm interested in. Um, you know, in some circumstances, erecting say a neoclassical folly in a park will have zero ideological well or very little ideological content. Might be a bit fussy and old fashioned and not to my not to my taste, but it doesn't might not matter particularly. Uh, reconstructing a whole city centre in a fake historical style with links to the far right is a completely different thing. So it's all it's the context and the intent behind it. It's not a battle of the styles. Having said that, in the UK, and I don't know if it's the same here, um, Beauty, the word beauty is being used by the Conservatives at the moment. It's actually being um, pushed into planning legislation, the promotion of beauty, and that's a code word for traditionalism. And it's something that King Prince, I was going to say, King Charles has pushed for decades in Panbury and elsewhere, often linked to cl neoclassicists um, and often linked to the right uh, again. Um, the Prince of Wales School of Architecture uh, has promoted 
reconstruction of classical buildings in Potsdam, including those associated with Prussian militarism and the Nazi era. Just, they're just foolish. They don't understand the imp implications and they don't, either don't think things through or they don't care enough. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, I don't think it's the style that matters. It's the, it's the purposes to which the style is put. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh.